All right, this is Justin Ridgely speaking from Fundera, and I'm here with Tyler McIntyre from uh, Bank Novo. Uh, we're, you know, we're starting off this webinar on PPP loan forgiveness. Uh, we're going to talk about the PPP program, uh, the different aspects of forgiveness, uh, and then kind of finish up with some Q&A. To give you a little bit of background about myself, uh, my name is Justin Ridgely. I'm the Senior Director of Finance at Fundera. Fundera is a company uh, that provides small business financial solutions, primarily uh, acts as a marketplace to connect small businesses with loans. Uh, and I've been doing PPP webinars now for a couple of months and act as our in-house expert. So happy to join Tyler here to, to kind of combine audiences and I'll let him tell you about uh, himself. Sure. Uh, so I'm Tyler McTyre. I'm one of the co-founders of Novo. Novo is a powerfully simple business bank online. So everything you want to do uh, when you used to be able to go into the branch today, online is more important than ever to run your businesses. And then even more important now also is these integrations to the tools that you use, whether it's real time accounting, um, or it's, uh, connecting to your Stripe, your square, your, um, you know, everything in between, even, even Slack, uh, making it just seamless to integrate banking with your, your business. Uh, and so that's what we do and, and kind of what we specialize in. So if you, anyone's looking for a better fee, uh, no hidden free fee bank account, Novo is the place for you. Awesome. Thanks for that background. So I'm going to start off uh, for those listening. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go through some slides here, which is essentially, like I said, a run through of where we are with the PPP program. Um, you know, what are the different parts of forgiveness from, you know, what's applicable? How do you apply? You know everything there, and I'm gonna I'm gonna go through some relatively simple slides. And Tyler, feel free to you know jump in you know where you think there could be some clarification, and you know ask me some questions. And we'll try to keep it a little less lecture focused and a little more conversational. And then you know once we get through that, then we'll we'll go towards uh, audience questions where we received you know a few questions pre-submitted, and then we'll be using the Q and A function in this Zoom webinar uh, for you to ask questions for those listening. So if you are on the line and you know you hear me touch on something or we, you know, we're discussing a topic that you're interested in, you know, please submit your questions through the Q&A function and we'll do our, address to or do our best to address those at the end of the webinar. So with that, I'm gonna, I'm gonna kick it off. Um, I guess I could have gone to our pictures first. Mine's a little more blurry, blurry than Tyler's, uh, unfortunately, but here's what we look like. We'll, we'll, enable our video down the line once we get through these slides. So this is a brief table of contents. And like I said, I'm, I don't want to lecture here. So I'm going to try to make this, you know, a quick presentation and then hopefully, you know, give people a lot of food for thought so we can talk through some Q&A. So just what is the program that this is the PPP update. So, you know, at the latest, the SBA has been releasing these stats about the program. You know, for those who remember, this was something that came out of the CARES Act that was passed, you know, in late March. The idea was to get, you know, businesses that needed funding uh, to protect their payrolls, you know, a, a large pot of money here. So far, uh, around $515 billion worth of loans have been made. Uh, but what that means is there's still $144 billion roughly left in the program. This program ends June 30th, so it will have run about from you know April uh, through May and through June, so about three months. Um, it has been you know very much utilized by by many businesses, with over 4.6 million different loans having been approved. You know there is a, a lot said about you know there was a round one, a round two in the first round. It was generally kind of felt that a lot of big businesses got money. The average size loan was 206,000. Thankfully, overall, that's come down now to, you know, 110,000 is the average loan, but 66% or two thirds of the loans were uh, under 50K in their, in their size. Uh, so it's been a successful program. It's helped a lot of people, you know, get money, which now we'll, we'll talk about how you can get that forgiven and kind of convert this loan to a grant. But, you know, the latest kind of major update was uh, on June 5th, a couple of weeks back, there was the PPP Flexibility Act signed by President Trump, which essentially made a number of changes to the PPP program, uh, namely, you know, this eight week period going to 24 weeks and this 75%, 25% split going to 60, 40. And we'll cover that um, in this, in the subsequent slides. But, you know, what's interesting right now is, you know, as this program kind of winds down and June 30th is the end for when you can apply, 
there is talk in Congress now, you know, amidst what else can we do to help the economy about a PPP 2.0 or a second round. So I think we're all interested to hear about, uh, you know, where, what could happen with that or what the criteria will be or if it'll actually get passed. Yeah, Justin, one of the big things that I've seen um, and a lot of questions being asked around this particular topic is it seems that the PPP uh, rules, the, the guidance, everything is constantly changing, right? Like you're yeah. bringing up this new PPP Flexibility Act, which is different than the CARES Act and all these different types of, of, of process. Um, how, how should we consider or think about the PPP loan kind of going forward? Is it something that is, is going to continue to change? Is it, you know, do they say that this Flexibility Act is the last, the last change that they foresee? Yeah, I think that's that's a great point. You know, this I've been doing these webinars typically twice a week on just for fun, Fundera's audience, and so I've you know had to stay up on this. And the amount of changes that have occurred week to week in the Treasury slash SBA's you know guidance has been staggering. I think you know when the first when the CARES Act was passed, that created you know this program, and then there was so many different pieces of guidance that were issued in the next three weeks as these loans were being generated. You know, now in the last like three or four weeks, it's been mostly focused on forgiveness and the SBA has issued, you know, three different applications for forgiveness, you know, over five, what they call interim final rules, which is just a, a bizarre sounding name for a uh, instructions guide anyway, but they continue to issue these constantly. And so, you know, the best kind of advice I think here for for the vast majority of people who aren't following you know the SBA on Twitter like I do to get these notifications is um, you know to, to to end up talking through this with your bank in terms of what how forgiveness is going to work because just to get started here I mean the bank is the place where you will uh, apply for forgiveness and they will be the ones interpreting this guidance so it doesn't do a borrower uh, you know a, re a recipient of PPP much good to try to keep up with all these different developments. And I would encourage people to kind of, you know, as we get here into July, when people start applying for forgiveness to, you know, to hear from their bank about what their process will be, you know, what their online portal is to apply and that kind of thing. Cause you know, you can't go submit your own forgiveness application to the SBA. So I think that's a good point Tyler. I think it's, it's not, it's really not worth the average person trying to monitor, you know, there's so much that changes. And so I think it's, you know, it'll be really kind of, that relationship you have with the the bank that gave you your loan uh, will be where you kind of next need to interface with to kind of wade through all that that changing knowledge because they're doing that on a daily basis. Yeah, and now that we have most of the people who are attending the webinar have already received the PPP. I think everyone's yep. interested in figuring out how do we actually go about getting it forgiven, and are these changes of the PPP Flexibility Act, et cetera, all the rules changing, are they making it more difficult or easier for businesses to get this forgiven? Yeah, I, yeah, let's, let's get into it. Uh, I think generally my view is that, uh, you know, it, the PPP FA is we're gonna just make a five letter acronym at this point, um, is, was a good step in the right direction and allowed for, you know, flexibility and a little bit more ease of, ease of forgiveness for a lot of borrowers. So let's hop in. So, you know, here's kind of what the first page of the application looks like. It's a, it's a, about a 12 page doc, I think. It's, it's relatively confusing. Uh, it looks almost like an IRS form. You know, we'll distribute this presentation, I believe, after this and it have kind of the key links. You know, this is the forgiveness form. Uh, this is the instructions. This is the final rule that guides it. There's also an, uh, an easy version of the application, which, um, I don't think is much easier for anyone, but you know, this is kind of the general concept. There's this form that exists. However, like I said, you know, in the same way that, you know, some people uh, are in the same way that a lot of times, you know, you don't maybe file your own taxes an accountant does it for you or technically TurboTax files, you know, in the same way that that happens, these forms, you're not going to directly fill out. Uh, you're going to fill them out through your bank. Uh, and you're not submitting to the SBA directly, you're submitting to the bank, the bank then petitions or not, or, you know, applies for forgiveness on your behalf, they receive the forgiven funds, and then they're the ones that, you know, forgive your loan on the back end. So, some important links here, but again, I wouldn't, the average person, um, you know, is not going to need to dive into this today and try to understand this before it happens. I think as long as you understand kind of the general rules, you can set yourself up for success on the back end. 
so these are just some, you know, there's probably too many bullet points on this page, but you know, the basic concept is, you know, these PPP loans were made to businesses uh, with the expectation that if you use them on certain types of expenses, namely payroll and a few select other types of expenses, you, these loans could be forgiven in whole or part. Um, this can be up to the full principal as well as any accrued interest. Uh, the actual amount of forgiveness depends on a few things. Like I said, you know, what you spend the loan on, um, you know, and then a couple other potential reductions. Your loan period uh, can either be eight weeks or 24 weeks if you received your loan prior to the PPP Flexibility Act, which was on June 5th. And if you received your loan on June 5th, 5th or afterward, you have to use this 24 week period. Um, I'm just gonna take a second to talk about this, this 24 week period versus the eight weeks, um, where this was the, one of the main changes in that act and the purpose was to allow businesses you know, a longer period of time to utilize these funds. Another point that I mentioned was this 60-40 split. So uh, I have it kind of as the 40% here, but essentially, you know, if you're going to submit for 100% of your loan to be forgiven, you have to use at least 60% on payroll expenses and no more than 40% on non-payroll costs. Independent contractors do not count as employees. Uh, proceeds from any you know, EIDL advance are deducted from the forgiveness amount, and you can only consider employees residing in the U.S. So those are kind of your ground rules. Yeah, Justin, makes sense. But the real question is, how does all this stuff work and apply? <laughs> so, you know, oh. is, is, you know, what's the covered period? You know, what what's, is that eight or 24 months, right, following the date? And, and what's covered? What percentage do I need to spend? And, you know, is like you're saying, the contractor counts. But what about an employee that left and came back? Yep. Yeah, the, the hard part about PPP, to be honest, is that or the forgiveness is that you know, it's almost, it's laborious to even explain what's going on, even without reading it yourself. Uh, like, it's just so hard to understand that I think it really highlights the complexity here. And, and you know, like I said, again, you know, we'll see down the road how the banks interpret this and make it easy to apply. But let's just break down each one of those points, I think, to get us started. So, you know, the concept of this covered period, uh, which is this eight weeks which is really, the SBA says, is, is they counted in days, not weeks, um, or 24 weeks. Like I said, you know, if you had a loan that was before June 5th, you're allowed to use either the original eight week period, which was kind of how the law was written, or this new 24 week period. Uh, the reason why is if you, know, if you were planning on that eight weeks and this, this legislation came very slowly, then you may have you know, spent your money in a way that makes more sense to apply for an eight week forgiveness period. But, if you've gotten your loan uh, you know, in, after June 5th, then you have to use this 24 week period. What this means is during these periods, this is when you have to account essentially for all the expenses that where you're spending your PPP loan. So if I got a $100,000 loan, if I wanna get it all forgiven, that means I have to spend it all within that either 56 day or 168 day period. And that essentially uh, is what is it, it's intended to cover and that is how you will be judged on your forgiveness. You can't, so, you know, go ahead. Justin, just a, a clarifying question. Wouldn't it be easier to spend the amount that you're given over a 24 week period, right? Because you're incurring more expenses over time versus that eight week period. Yeah, exactly. And I think that that was the kind of the impetus behind making this change. And specifically, a lot of, you know, restaurants uh, or in-person businesses lobbied for this. And, you know, the rationale was, well, if I can't be open in my physical location, you know, due to, to COVID-based restrictions, then I'm essentially, you know, if I want to use this in eight weeks, I essentially have to pay people to not work. Uh, versus, you know, if it's 24 weeks, you see businesses are starting to open back up now, and many places are fully open. Uh, then, you know, I could have conserved that money and used it on payroll once the business was back open. So the 24 week period uh, is going to be better for the probably, you know, the vast majority of businesses and gives people more flexibility to spend the money uh, in the most, you know, advantageous way for their business. To make things even a little bit more confusing, you know, the SBA has these two ways where basically two start dates for this time time frame. You can either use the covered period, uh, you know, or this alternate covered period. 
you know, one just says you start that, that countdown on the day you get the loan. The other says you start on your next payroll period. Uh, kind of, I summed it up here is, you know, if you want to stuff the maximum amount of expenses in your PPP, then, you know, you can use the kind of the, the regular one for most businesses. It's easier just to match your payroll cycles. And the first one was only really more applicable when it was eight weeks and you were worried about getting all of your, you know, loan forgiven by having to spend it in such a short amount of time. The expenses uh, that fit in that period either have to be paid or incurred. So that means either the cash has to leave your bank account during this time or be charged on your credit card. Or in the case that, you know, you uh, have a, you know, your rent is due on the 31st and, or, or let's just say your rent period ends the 31st, your loan date ends the 31st of say August, but the actual payment for that rent is due September 5th. You can count that uh, as part of your loan forgiveness because it was incurred during that period. So essentially this is just sets this paid and incurred standard, uh, just trying to define you know, what fits in this period of time. It's real, this is one of the more simple things to understand. So this is a big one. There's two types of costs that you can essentially expense as forgiven, uh, you know, during your period, your covered period. Those are payroll and non-payroll. And so I know we're, we're going to have a lot of questions here. I feel so feel free to jump in here as this one gets a little complicated. But um, simply put, you know, for payroll, there there's two types of cost: cash compensation and then non-cash. Cash compensation is exactly what it sounds. That's gross salary, wages, tips, commissions, bonuses, hazard pay, uh, paid leave, except for Family First Coronavirus Response Act family leave. Uh, also even allowances for dismissal or separation, aka severance. Uh, and this is essentially what, you know, what is counted as cash cop everything, essentially. Uh, there's not really much that's excluded here. And then you know, with that, you have to also then, uh, there's a cap on what you can include here, which is this 100K run rate, which we'll get back into. But the second part is, um, these are the non-cash uh, payroll costs, which are employer contributions to healthcare, retirement, uh, as well as employer paid state and local taxes like state unemployment. Now, one thing I, I just glossed over here, I, didn't, I intentionally skipped to come back to it, is this concept of an owner employee, a self-employed individual, a general partner, you know, someone with an, as an LLC member that receives distributions. Um, you know, there was a lot, there were a lot of uncertainties in how this would be interpreted. And I apologize for this complicated slide, but this is even a distillation of the SBA's documentation, if you could believe that. Um, but essentially it defines things slightly differently. And, you know, the way it works is essentially you're capped as, you know, if you're a sole prop, the amount you can include uh, for PPP forgiveness uh, as part of your payroll is essentially the lesser of, you know, two and a half months of your 2019 uh, income or this maximum of, 20,833, which is two and a half months at $100,000. So there was some concern previously that if you were self-employed and you had to use this $15,000 cap, you wouldn't essentially be able to spend your whole loan on payroll. This two and a half times concept, this two and a half months concept basically means that, you know, if you had a loan that was based off your 2019 average monthly payroll times 2.5, then if you are able to expense two and a half months worth of that 12 months, essentially you can expense your whole loan as payroll, which makes sense given that a lot of sole props don't have costs like rent or others. Tyler, any questions there? I know I'm, this is super yeah. complicated. <laughs> you know, and I, I think that what might make sense is for us to dive into the Q and A because uh, you know, that is yeah. such a big topic and it applies to so many different people yeah. around, you know, payroll, et cetera. And I know that, you know, everyone is trying to really dive into, well, how does this apply to me? Right. Yeah. And, so let's... you know, my pre or post, et cetera. And what, uh, you know, I think around the payroll cost, what's really, really important to highlight is that the government is bringing it down from 75% of that cost being payroll to 60% to of the cost being payroll and extending that period to be 24 months because they want to provide yeah. the flexibility 
for many of the businesses that are impacted by COVID to, uh, to qualify and, 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 you know, actually be able to apply for forgiveness um, when it comes to these, these different types of payroll costs. And oftentimes it, it's just going to kind of figure out how do you actually see yourself as a self-employed individual uh, filing for that? Yeah. And I think you know, another point is this will, a lot of this will get kind of worked out when you apply with your bank, you know, they'll kind of help you interpret this. So I think what I'm going to do is keep going. Like you said, I think we come back to this uh, in Q and A and talk about some specifics, but the other, uh, you know, types of costs that you can include in your forgiveness amount that are non-payroll are uh, mortgage interest payments, rent, utilities, uh, and then as well refinancing and SBA EIDL loan. The one thing, you know, typically we get asked a lot about, you know, what is included in utilities. That's specifically the list that's here, you know, typical things like electricity, gas, telephone, internet access, transportation is a bit vague. Um, but, you know, I, we'll, we'll see if anything further comes out on that. But these are essentially the main three buckets you, that you can get forgiven. And as Tyler mentioned, there's 60% have to be payroll, you know, 40% can, up to 40% can be these three categories. So what this looks like, just a sample here is, you know, if you, this is a 24 week period with a simple $100,000 loan, um, you know, here you've essentially, this is what you've spent, uh, this 129,000 and 2000. Uh, and then, you know, the way you can apply for this, you know, it are a couple different ways. You know, you could do it uh, where you just submit payroll costs or you could do it as a combination of, you know, payroll, rent and utilities. It's kind of up to you. And again, we'll get into that in the q and I'm going to move forward to a couple of prudential reductions, and I'll really try to keep these high level because they are extremely complicated. The first one is, you know, if you essentially reduce your employees during your loan period, you may be penalized for that reduction on a proportional basis. So if, you know, back in January, I had 10 employees and I had to let three of them go, and now I have seven, you may receive a, you know, 30% reduction depending on how the math actually works out. Similarly, if you've reduced either salary or wage, you know, hourly rates uh, by over 25% in this covered period, you may also have, you know, get dinged on a potential reduction in your uh, forgiveness amount. There are two ways you can kind of get out of these reductions. Uh, this is the safe harbor one. And what this essentially means is if your business, you know, had a physical location was shut down due to guidance related to anything COVID related, essentially, is that that neither of those potential reductions will apply to you. Uh, as the SBA said, both indirect, indirect compliance with these guidance uh, is fine. The and Justin, one, yeah. yeah. Uh, well, I know that this is, uh, during the time where, where PPP was happening, there were so many business owners who didn't know what was actually gonna happen or even if they were gonna get PPP, right? Uh, yeah. And most of them had to make definitive decisions of, do I let some of the people go uh, now um, or during that period in before I understood, you know, my forgiveness around PPP. Um, is there anything that the government is doing around uh, where you would uh, have let somebody go and then tried to rehire and bring back your headcount to the level that it once was, right? And then, yeah. you know, in a good faith effort, uh, try to kind of hire back the people that, that you had to let go with, the limited information you had at the time. Yeah, I think that, you know, the limited information and the timing of it all is what partially made this so complicated is like, you know, how you kind of let off this conversation say, you know, there's been so many changes, right? Well, the part of it, the part of the problem was that the changes all didn't happen in the first five days. They happened over the course of eight, eight weeks or more. And so there was a lot of decisions, you know, that business owners needed to make that they couldn't make with this imperfect information. So how that plays in here is, you know, if you had to reduce your headcount um, and you could potentially get penalized by either, you know, by this first rule here, this full-time equivalency rule, you know, there's two ways to get out of that. Like I said, this is a new one, this Safe Harbor One, which just popped up uh, after the, the Flexibility Act on June 5th. And this is a good get out of jail free card for a lot of people, because especially if you have any type of physical location and you were forced to close, uh, to the point where they they said it's a significant reduction in business activity, uh, then you know neither of those reductions apply. What you mentioned is, is kind of this other concept of, you know, how do I if I rehire employees I've let go, do I get penalized? And the answer to that is no. 
if you, you know, if you had 10 employees and you laid off three and you then had 10 employees at the, either the end of your covered period, whenever your 24 or eight weeks is over, or even, you know, say your period ended in October, as long as you do it by December 31st, 2020 and apply after that, you know, you also will not be penalized. So you could potentially, you know, have had 10, let go three, hired back to your loan period ends. And then in December 30th, you hire back a 10th. You would then not be penalized at all if you applied, you know, in that, that January. The another scenario you mentioned was, okay, well, I let someone, you know, I let three people go. Two of them I hired back or I hired different people, but this third one I made an offer to and they don't, they don't accept it. And I, you know, I can't, I'm having problems hiring someone. Uh, in that case, you wouldn't be penalized either. You know, the SBA specifically said that if you're making, you know, a good faith effort to rehire people, then you're doing the right thing. And, you know, getting back to the name of the program, the Paycheck Protection Program, it's all about, you know, keeping employees hired, right? So if you're trying to do the right thing, you won't be penalized. Great. So let's touch just quickly, uh, you know, on applic the application and documentation. This is just some general guidance. Like I said, you will apply with your bank. And I think then that's probably, you know, the most important piece of this whole thing is all of this will be done through the bank with which you received your loan. Uh, this is, so this is just more be aware, you know, there's, there's an application which they'll probably convert, you know, into some sort of online uh, flow, you know, some application you submit. You can apply for forgiveness anytime within your covered period if you've spent the funds. So if you're in your 12th week and you've already exhausted your PPP funds and spent them on forgivable costs, then you can apply then. And that's important too also if you're considering, you know, I've hired, I've, I, you know, that, that 10 person example, if I had 10 employees, let three go, I hired three back, but I don't know where I'll be at the end of the year. So I have 10 now, but maybe I'll have only nine in November. Well, then you probably want to apply sooner rather than later so you can get the forgiveness over with and you don't have to worry about you know future reductions in headcount so i think that's an important point you can you don't have to wait to the 24 weeks to be over to apply um basically this these are just some some general guidelines the lender basically has 60 days from when you apply to let you know the you know if you're forgiven or not yeah, and I know that what we were talking about before around this forgiveness process is that um, every bank is going to be unique, right, around what documents they need, collect, yep. um, et cetera. And obviously, you got to figure out how to prove that you've been paying payroll, how you've been, you know, have mortgage expenses, rent expenses, et cetera. Um, from a high level, what can everybody expect uh, your bank to ask you to provide? Yeah, great question. So... The general uh, view is that you know the same types of documents that you use to get your PPP loan in the first place are, are, are going to be the kinds of documents that you use to get forgiveness. I was actually on a you know a conference call last week with a number of, of big banks and some payroll providers, and they were talking all about forgiveness and what the you know how they'll do this, and you know that was largely the consensus that they're going to rely on. You know, a lot of payroll provider reports, they're going to rely on any tax documents that are available. They rely on things like bank statements um, for things like rent. You know, that'll be, you know, your monthly rent statement from your landlord, uh, you know, for utilities, that's going to be your utility bill. It's essentially, you know, the, the standard they're going for is, you know, tax is the best, uh, you know, payroll providers are kind of second best. And then, you know, anything that's a third party Kind of receipt or bill or proof of some sort of action, uh, you know, is best. And I have some some things that were listed by the SBA here. Tax forms are obviously a bit more complicated if you apply for forgiveness before the end of the year, right? Because annual forms won't be done. Um, and so, Tyler, I think the real question is here. There's a lot of people that are, you know, sole proprietors that don't have payroll companies that you know don't file taxes except on their personal taxes. Um, and those people aren't really given much guidance right now, unfortunately. I can, I think maybe we can either get into Q&A or now, but there are some strategies I think you could take, but what do you, what do you think? Yeah, absolutely. And, and the one thing I've heard um, kind of on the street is that there is going to be a little bit more clarity as they try to figure out how to do yeah. this. But once again, it's one of these things where the government's going to provide some type of maybe limited, um, very loose guidance and 
mainly it's around a conversation with your bank and saying, hey, how would you like me to prove my payroll expenses where I was paying myself? Do I need a, a W-2? Do I, can I show you payments from my personal account or from, does it have to be a, a quote unquote sole prop business account? Yeah. Yeah, there's, there's a lot of uncertainty there. And I do think yeah, it's going gonna, it's gonna to come down to what the bank asks for and what they deem sufficient. Um, and that's going to be, it's going to be tough. I mean, I've heard of, you know, if you're a sole proprietor and you don't have a separate business account, you know, I've heard of people thinking about writing themselves a check, right. And doing that that way. I know some people have, have said, okay, I'm just going to make sure, you know, I do use QuickBooks, but I don't have a separate account. So I'm just going to make sure I record all the payments to myself, you know, in, in a lot of detail, you know, in your general ledger, there's that. I've also, you know, a lot of people uh, took the strategy of, when they got the PPP, they, they did set up a separate business account deposited there, and then they only pay themselves, you know, out of that account to their personal account. So that ship is largely. So, yeah. Sailed, we're seeing a you know. lot of, a lot of businesses, especially sole props, um, you know, people who are in that, that 1099 group, um, yep. where they're that they're independent contractors, uh, work on their own businesses, you know, setting up business accounts, like now was a, a, a huge kind of win in the sales for people to say, you know what, I should separate my personal from my business expenses to make things like this a lot easier, right? Yeah. A lot more clean when it comes to parsing between your credit card and your personal bank statements and showing what was a business expense and what was a personal expense. And obviously when you do run things through, uh, even if it's a, a Novo accounts, um, you know, with your name on it, cause you're a sole proprietor, um, it shows and proves that, look, I'm really using this for business purposes and I'm using that other account in my name for personal purposes uh, and kind of creates that real type of clean um, distinction between what were you using those funds for and was it actually, you know, to pay yourself from your, you know, Novo business account to your, maybe your JP Morgan Chase account personally. And yeah, that could definitely. just be a, a money transfer, right? It doesn't even have to yep. be a check. Yeah, in that case, then you would just, you know, send the bank statements in essentially from the business account, right? And I think, you know, that was definitely, a, if you were able to do that up front, I think that that was a, probably a great way to go. But, you know, the, there's going to have to be some methodology worked out for, for those uh, who didn't, you know, do that starting off. And it may even be just some sort of, you know, here's what I spent in, a, in an Excel and you PDF that and send it in. We'll, we'll, you know, we'll kind of see there. Um, but you know, like I said, on the screen here, there's some, some examples of documents that are acceptable that were provided by the SBA in their, in the application. So this is another one, you know, documentation wise that I've, I tend to talk about a lot on my webinars, which is that case you brought up earlier, Tyler, which was, you know, what happens if you try to hire someone back and they don't accept your offer, but you don't want to, you know, you shouldn't be penalized for that. Well, how do you prove that? Um, and this is, you know, a question I get asked a lot on webinars. And my general answer to that is, you know, try to get everything in writing. Everything you're doing, you know, the standard for all these, all this documentation is you want something that's third party and you want it detailed and you want it in writing. And so, you know, if you're in a position here where you are making offers to people, you know, you ideally want a written offer with a written response of, you know, denial or whatever the correspondence may be, because you know, if you're trying to submit to the SBA and through the bank that you did make this offer and it was turned down, then you'll need some sort of written correspondence to prove that. These are the, uh, on this slide, there are a few other cases. You know, this is an employee rejecting offer case that I just talked about. If you fire someone for cause, that also won't penalize you. Also that employees that voluntarily resign and employees that maybe you reduce their hours uh, and then they didn't want those hours back uh, if you offered them to them. So there are a few carve outs. Yeah. So obviously, Justin, this is a tremendous amount of information. I'm sure that we got tons of questions coming out of this. Um, some that we've, we've collected here. Um, but I think the next step here is just to kind of dive into them and, yeah. and try to answer some of these questions because we both know it's a lot of content. It's a moving target for many people to kind of truly understand what does it mean um, when the SBA is saying something that is so generic, the bank is trying to, to understand what's happening and 
more importantly is kind of what is the general consensus across you know all these different financial institutions and people's interpretations of the SBA or the Treasury's guidance around it. Yeah, most definitely. Let's do it. So, yeah, so the real question around is, uh, I guess let's start with the first question. If you have applied for a payroll protection only and were approved for the funds dispersed, is there a way to supplement your application to receive additional forgivable PPP funds uh, for operational expenses? Uh, so you... Yeah, so no, uh, there have been cases, you know, I've heard where people say, you know, they applied for their loan and they realized later that they could have gotten more money. Um, you can't unfortunately, you know, pay off your loan and go get another one. You, you know, you kind of have your one shot at PPP and that's the loan that you get. Um, so you, you can't do that. Uh, and, you know, you can obviously you spend what you need on business expenses, but the only thing you're going to get forgiven is up to that original amount. Yeah. And Justin, I know that you've also talked a little bit about exactly when people should apply for forgiveness. You know, you said, look, if, if you don't want to wait, you can apply early. And if you do want to wait and, and, and kind of, you know, say I want to apply in, let's just say August, uh, you can also do that um, post a 24 week period. Uh, what do you think is the best time to kind of look for uh, applying for forgiveness? Is it the sooner the better or, you know, kind of if you want to drag it out? So I, I actually think that this is, pro is probably like the when to apply is going to be one of the, you know, I said, you know, earlier we talked about, you know, you have to wait and see what the banks do and all that. But like, this is one area I think where the business owner can use some strategy. Um, and, you know, the, the situation will vary depending on, you know, the business circumstances. But generally, I th this is the way I would think about it is that, you know, if you get to a point where you've spent your, your funds, uh, on forgivable expenses, and you shouldn't apply, I, I don't think, unless, in my opinion, you've spent all the funds on forgivable expenses. You have 24 weeks, so you should more than, you know, be able to kind of you know, disperse the, those funds over that much longer period of time than originally envisioned. But once you get to that point, you know, you kind of have a decision to make. If I'm in my, you know, 10 weeks, or whether it's 10 weeks, 12 weeks, 20 weeks, uh, and I've said, okay, I've now spent 100% of this on, you know, between payroll and rent, and I want to apply for forgiveness, then my next question would be, okay, what does my employee count and employee, you know, pay levels look like? If I've not reduced anything since, you know, before kind of February 15th, then I would go and I would apply right then because you'll get your cash sooner, uh, or sorry, you'll get your forgiveness, uh, you know, approved sooner, and you can kind of stop worrying about PPP and, and go on, you know, running your business. If, however, you say, okay, I've spent my funds, but, you know, I've had 10 employees, now I have nine, but I think next month I'm going to hire a 10th back, then I would wait until you, after you do that to apply. So what this is, it's kind of like a balance between like, once you get to that point where you've spent the money, you, I would say you're kind of in your application window. And then it's a real consideration of, well, what, what happened with my employees? And if by waiting longer, could I avoid these penalties by, you know, hiring people back or getting back to that employment level or whatnot? Um, I also think there's a little bit of gaming there you could do, you know, if you did make someone an offer and they refused, uh, and then you, you were like, okay, if I have that, I don't have a penalty, you can apply right after that. And then you don't have to worry about that dragging on and the SBA maybe asking later, well, you had another three months to hire the same position kind of thing. Yeah. Does that make sense? Yeah, absolutely. So, you know, another thing is, is kind of who do you go to apply for forgiveness? I know that uh, Novo and Fundera partnered to help out, you know, um, a lot of our small businesses get loans, right? And in the time of PPP, where everybody's trying to get loans, uh, everyone's, you know, the small business banks, uh, we're all clogged up with applications. Yeah. Um, you know, Nova worked closely with Fundera to, to be able to say, can we get their application kind of uh, prepared and prepped to hand over to a bank, often being, say, Cross River Bank. But now you have Novo, you have Fundera, and you have Cross River, uh, all who've kind of helped you in the process of getting that capital. Um, 
Well, who do you end up going to for loan forgiveness? Yeah, in, in that example, uh, you know, you would go to Cross River. Uh, you know, the lender who dispersed your funds is the, you know, the entity which you will interact with for forgiveness. You know, we did, uh, we obviously, as you said, work together and we, 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 you know, I think did a good job or tried to do a good job of facilitating, you know, borrowers going to banks that could actually serve them. Um, but for forgiveness, it's going to be a, you know, kind of a one-to-one -one with the bank. Um, and, you know, we'll keep doing at least at Fundera, you know, educational kind of content to help people think about this, but, you know, the bank is going to be the one that's going to process this application at the end of the day. And the, the kind of the process is a little more direct to them this time around versus the, the original application process. Great. And I, I just want to switch quick gears into talking about the, um, a little bit more clarity around that eight week or 24 week period, et cetera. Um, obviously there's some, a, a big group of people who've applied, you know, through us yeah. that got the loans before June 5th. Yep. Um, and at what point, you know, do you have, do you have to declare that you're going to opt in for the 24 week period or is that after the fact, uh, when you do go for applying for forgiveness, then you notify them that, look, I want to do the eight week or the 24 week period. Yeah, good question. Uh, so if you uh, received your loan prior to June 5th and you're wondering what you have to do to do either period, you don't have to do anything. There's no election you have to make. Uh, there's nothing you have to tell the bank or the SBA. It just matters when you apply, you know, there's essentially a box you check and say which period you're using. And, um, you know, again, if you, if you were someone that, you know, maybe got your loan really early, like April 1st or April 10th, uh, you know, then you might still, you probably operated under this eight week planning period, you know, for almost that whole eight weeks before this PPPFA came out right in June 5th. So if you want to do the eight weeks, you still can. Um, but then again, if, if you've received your loan the last few weeks since June 5th, you have to use the 24 weeks, but either way, you know, you only indicate which you're using on your application. And the only stipulation as to choice is that June 5th cutoff. Yeah, no, it makes sense. Um, it, it's interesting that, you know, it's one of these things where you got to kind of provide a lot of the information yourselves and come into yeah. the forgiveness process uh, well prepared. So I think it's good that all the small business owners are, you know, educating themselves enough to say, how can I optimize forgiveness for my company uh, in, in a meeting like this? And I know it's, it, it's kind of easy to understand when you have 10 employees, 20 employees, kind of how to figure it out. But I want to, to switch gears once more and, and start sure. talking about the, the self-employed people or the 1099ers. Uh, we see a huge surge of them. And unfortunately, you know, the government didn't really prioritize them in the first wave of PPP loans, right? We started yeah, seeing a lot not. of the self-employment people coming in and that delay in getting the funds to PPP uh, to these self-contractors or, or sole props or whatever you may want to call them um, yeah. was delayed. And so is guidance around it. Right. And so, you know, wanted to kind of just talk a little bit more about, about the, the sole props and, and kind of ask some questions around them. That was good. Um, so when you're looking at a, a, a 1099 er right. Somebody who, yeah. who gets a 1099 every single um you know, for, for, let's just say a gig work or gig economy, you drive for somebody like Uber or, or Instacart, et cetera. Um, how would you go about justifying those expenses uh, or the forgiveness to your lender? Would you go ahead and show what you were making before and kind of what you've, you continue to drive for Uber? Yeah. So, I mean, those, Let's see. So those loans typically when we were, you know, when they were being issued were based off of, you know, your, your 1040, your schedule C, uh, maybe schedule F uh, for 2019, or, you know, maybe you had uh, all of your 1099s and that's what you were kind of, you know, basing that loan off of. And I think the way, you know, it's going to work in terms of proving, you know, what you paid yourself, um, 
is going to be, it's kind of unknown, right? I think the cap was what I was trying to get into before of, you know, how much can you pay yourself? Well, if I was a, you know, someone who was working and receiving 1099s in my, you know, net income or of that revenue was say, you know, $50,000 um, in 2019, then, you know, the most that you'll be able to pay yourself essentially then um, would be two and a half months worth of that. And that's $20,000, right? Uh, so, you know, it's, excuse me, that's, that's actually incorrect. Um, but, you know, so it's essentially like you can pay yourself two and a half months of what you earned in 2019. Uh, and you will prove it probably by just transferring money to your bank account if you're not working because you're kind of out of work due to COVID. Um, it's a little bit less clear how the like current earnings will be treated, I guess. Um, it's a little yeah. weird because you're like receiving, it's like revenue and profit all in one. It's, just, it's, it's hard to, it's a little harder to think about. Yeah. And, and, you know, I brought that up because I know that that, like we were saying before, there just hasn't been any guidance in how this should be treated. And hopefully that there's going to be a little bit more around this, um, you know, and so, you know, make sure to keep yourself informed as more and more information is kind of being uh, shared. Right. Um, but for many small business owners, right. When you have maybe just yourself working through your business, it maybe doesn't make sense to give yourself a W-2 and pay payroll tax, et cetera, yeah. on what you're making. And many small business owners, uh, especially when they're getting started and off the ground, they just pay themselves with a 1099, right? In, in a way to say, hey, look, I was an employee of my own business. How would you go about, um, I guess, applying for forgiveness when you are a, uh, say, a single member LLC where you are um, paying yourself with a 1099? So in that case, you know, technically you would have to, I guess, uh, I think it depends which entity, I guess you would have gotten a loan probably as the single member LLC, or you could have gotten it as an individual in that case. Um, you can't, I guess, count like if the corporate entity is the LLC, like I said, in the, I think the first slide, you know, 1099 employees don't count, but here you are the business and the employee. Uh, so, however, I guess you want to think about that, the way that that would work was, you know, the more I think about this is that essentially what this is for a lot of people will be like a, an income or a, a payroll replacement, you know, where typically like, you know, you receive income in and that goes straight to you as your pay in this case. And now maybe it's due to COVID and the economy, you don't have as much pay coming in, but you can still pay yourself you know, those, to those prior levels uh, from the PPP funds. And I think it's going to be less about what you earn during this period and more about just paying yourself at an equivalent 2019 level out of the PPP funds. If we're talking about doing this, I think in that case where a business like a single member LLC pays themselves as a 1099, um, then it'll essentially be that individual who will essentially be replacing that former income with PPP funds. I think it's possible that, you know, you could make out as a self-employed person better off where, you know, you maybe are making 50% of the revenue you made each month in 2019, but you can pay yourself your full, you know, salary, so to speak, from PPP while maybe also still earning some revenue uh, on top of that. So, you know, we'll, we'll see how that guidance tightens, but I, I think generally it's, it should be viewed almost as like an income replacement and less tied to what you earn during this covered period. With that, you bring in sometimes freelancers, whether it's a graphic designer, the videographer, it, um, you know, they're almost working for you like an employee, um, but mm -hmm. you know, they're also getting 1099s. And is it, the way you should think about it is, even though they are, um, you know, working for you full time and you're paying them every single month for their work, uh, but because they're receiving the 1099, it shouldn't really be considered payroll. Correct. So, yeah, this is this weird concept, or it's hard to kind of hard to wrap your head around. Where like, you know, 1099 uh, re recipients are considered employees. So, like, if I was a, an employer that had five 
you know, hired two people full time and then I had two contractors on 1099s. I could apply for PPP based on those two employees. Uh, and then the contractors would have to apply for PPP themselves. So basically any recipient of 1099s that they're, the, the company sending to those to them doesn't get to count that in their PPP. The individuals receiving them have to get their own PPP and thus that's the basis for how that's paid out. Um, so if you have, like if you're a case where you know, you're a, you, you pay contractors through 1099s, it's on those contractors then to have gotten their own PPP loans and be getting paid via that, that loan uh, currently and not on the business that paid them the 1099s. Yeah, so it, it gets much more complex, I know, for sole profs. And you know, I, I don't know if we have the answer for every question here today, nor does um, you know, possibly even your bank. But it's really about figuring out how, does, how do they interpret it? How do they look at yeah. these different things? And what are the requirements for it? I know another one is you know, when you're saying, hey, you could use a portion of the PPP loans on mortgage and rent expenses. Yeah. Well, if you have a home office, um, you know, what percentage of your mortgage, you know, could you kind of justify um, saying that that was a part business expense that, you know, went to, to running my home office, similar to the way that you might do make a tax deduction um, on your home office space, right? Um, yeah. So it's not a standardized, you know, this is, you know, if you if you're a sole prop and and this is how you pay, et cetera, you know the formula is is, is a lot more obscure, um, compared to you know if you're if you had a bunch of W two employees. Yeah, definitely, and I think the, what you mentioned that was important was that you know the tax deduction. I think you know if you're a sole prop or, or a self employed individual of any kind, you know that is you know in a home office or or, or anything like that. And you're wondering, you know, can I put part of my mortgage interest on here? Can I put, you know, my uh, utilities on here? I think the standard you need to go with, and I, I guess I should say beyond I think, this is kind of the you know, preliminary guidance that's been given is if, you, if that's something you put on your taxes as a business expense, then you should feel free to put that as a forgivable expense on PPP. Um, if this is something you've never done before, you know, you filed your taxes last year and you didn't include a home office, but now you want to put it in forgiveness, I'd say that's likely to get uh, denied. So I think that's a good standard to use is the, you know, the IRS guidelines on how to expense those, you know, the proportionality of those expenses. Um, you know, but beyond that, that's why most, I think, you know, self-employed individuals, the mostly it's just going to be payroll to themselves as, as a form of income replacement, essentially. Yeah. And when you're, you know, and this is kind of the, the feedback that I've gotten from a lot of small business owners when they do approach a lot of the banks out there and they start looking for, hey, can you help me provide some of this information or how should I be thinking about, you know, the way that I, I, I pay myself, et cetera. Many of them are remaining much more coy in providing guidance to them because they themselves don't 100% know what their policy is going to be, um, you know, in a week from now, in, in, in eight weeks from now, 24 weeks from now, um, with these, these PPP periods. Um, you know, many people are saying, hey, you know, reach out to your, your CPA, your accountant, and try to figure out, you know, how would you kind of, you know, justify some of these expenses and come to the bank with it. Um, but outside of, of you know, if, if you're not really getting the answers you want from the bank and you're not, you know, maybe you can't afford a CPA or you don't need, you, you know, you only had a, a $2,000 loan um, and a CPA is going to cost you $500. I might not justify the expense there. Where else could you go today to get more information, keeping yourself informed uh, when it comes to PPP forgiveness? That's a, you know, you, you hit on a lot of good points there. Um, you know, this is, it's a needlessly complex program that really, you know, that those without advisors, you know, kind of fare the worst here and have the least amount of guidance. I think it, if I were, you know, thinking about how to understand this, I think if you're listening, you're, you're doing the right thing so far, you know, I, I'm, like I said, I don't know anything or everything about PPP forgiveness, but I think we're putting out a good amount of, you know, what we know now kind of guidance and like things may change, but I think, you know, attending webinars like this is always a good start. So a lot of companies that are doing them. Uh, we've written about how to get forgiveness a, a lot on Fundera's blog. 
Uh, there's also a, a lot of other companies writing about it, you know, uh, accounting firms, law firms, payroll companies. Um, and I think, you know, Google will be your friend here. And it's one of those things where maybe if you read, you know, four articles, you'll probably figure out what the answer and how it applies to you is. I think part of the challenge is not just finding the guidance, but, but then interpreting it to your own individual situation. And, you know, this is one of those scenarios where that type of research is, it might not always be necessary, but could pay dividends. And then, you know, I'm hopeful that the banks will create, you know, uh, experiences by which, you know, they standardize some of these requirements. Uh, they're, they're made easier for self-employed individuals and, and it can kind of become a simple process. Um, but judging by how this whole thing has gone, I'm not, I'm not quite holding my breath there. Yeah. And so today, I, I think what we, we've talked a little bit about is what are some of the best practices we've seen, right? When, yeah. you know, looking at what we know today, especially with the, the PPP FA, uh, talking about extended period of time, you trying to hire, um, you know, hire back people, you keeping your head count, you know, at a certain level, even up till December. There's a lot of new guidance out there that really, I think, includes many more businesses today in forgiveness than they ever, you know, when originally yeah. kind of proposed, right? Which is a great yeah. benefit. But for the 1099 and, and, the, and the, you know, the, the business owners and the, and the contractors that are out there, um, it's a lot more vague um, and there still needs to be more guidance. I think today what we've seen is, you know, what is it that is best practice to kind of set people up for success is really, you know, keep looking, you know, for more information, guidance around this, you know, check Pandera's blog, you know, look into the SBA, especially Twitter, you know, where they're tweeting some, some new uh, information that's coming out. Uh, try to make sure that you set up and you separate your personal accounts from your business accounts or, or find a way that you can clearly articulate um, that you're making a payment to yourself, right? From a, the, the business version of you to your personal uh, account, right? Um, yeah. In order to kind of help set up to, sh to prove that quote unquote payroll uh, to yourself. Um, and then as always, you know, checking in with your bank to say, hey, you know, how can I, you know, be aligned with your forgiveness policy? Or do you have any documentation that I can look at uh, for forgiveness to be well prepared when you come into that meeting because it's one of these things where the bank is putting the onerous on you to make sure that you qualify, that you ask, that you fill it out for you to kind of provide to them instead of the other way around. Um, and so when it comes to 1099ers and it comes to, uh, you know, subcontractors, business owners that, that aren't, you know, W2'd, um, it's, I think, putting some of those processes in place today uh, in order to kind of set you up for success down the road. Uh, and then for the businesses that have the W-2, et cetera, just to make sure that with the new guidance, can you get to 100% forgiveness? Uh, because the government across the board, what they're trying to do is really not trying to get the money back from small businesses. They're trying to push the money into the economy and keep it in the economy, keep it in small businesses, and, you know, even to the point that they're saying, what would a PPP V2 look like, right? Yep. Um, so it's, it's all about helping the business owners there and, and trying to get that money to be forgiven as much as they can. Um, and so, you know, with the guidance that's out today, um, just kind of look at how you've structured your employees and, and your payment and your payroll and see if it compares and, and, you know, meets the requirements, which are, you know, have been lowered. Uh, with these new kind of uh, uh, rulings uh, to to be you know forgiven and obviously keep keep up to date with Fundera and, and the guidance that you guys are offering. I'm sure there's going to be uh, a follow up um, you know webinar to this as well. Yeah, I, exactly. I think you hit the nail on the head. Uh, we do. I do a once a week webinar on, with Fundera as well, and like we'll, we may do another one and. I think, you know, just try to keep yourself informed, uh, you know, and, and plan for what you can. And then, you know, we'll see how everything else shakes out. Great. Well, I think we're at time, uh, Justin, but yeah, perfect. You know, definitely I learned a lot. Yeah. I, uh, you know, hopefully it was useful for people. It's a tough subject to explain uh, succinctly. So 
thanks for bearing with me and uh you know thanks for do, for doing the q a hopefully we got some people's questions answered and you know uh i think it, i hope it was beneficial for those listening so thanks a lot tyler